An anonymous uh, listener writes, I've been struggling with forgiving someone for over a year now. I told my husband last year sometime near Christmas that I knew I needed forgiving uh, to forgive this person, and I remember sitting on the floor next to our Christmas tree confessing to God that I had such anger and bitterness towards this individual and that I knew I needed to forgive him, and I asked the Lord to help me with that. In that moment, I remember feeling such peace. I truly believe I had forgiven him. I won't go into detail about what happened, but I will tell you he did some work for my husband and I, which he never fully completed. We paid him in full because my husband and dad were able to finish the work for free. What a blessing that was, and I'm truly thankful for that. However, there have been multiple problems with the work that this man did do. He refuses to take responsibility for it and wants to charge me for the additional work he needs to do, which is covered under warranty. Furthermore, he tells me he will come and fix it and never shows up. This has been going on since January of this year. I've spoken to other professionals in his field. They tell me I have grounds to sue, which I really don't want to do, or I could report him to the state and at the very least have a mark against his license and possibly have it taken away. These are both drastic measures, which I really don't want to do. He's a brother in Christ and a member of the church I attend. Okay. Okay. I really just want it fixed. I'm not asking you for advice about the incomplete work, but how do you continue to forgive someone in this instance when I'm told he will fix it and doesn't show up or has an excuse of how busy he is and will get it done, but months have gone by? Does forgiveness look like walking away from him and paying someone else to do the job he's supposed to do? Or can you forgive someone and still report them to the state? Truthfully, I don't think he's good at his job and would hate for someone else to go through what we went through. When Jesus paid the penalty for our sins, it was finished. It was complete. And it says in Hebrews and Jeremiah that he will remember our sins no more. And I know we're supposed to give like, uh, we're supposed to give like he forgave, but it's so hard when you paid for a job to be done and you continue to get the runaround. How do I forgive this man the way Jesus did? How do I live this out? I have prayed a lot about this, but I'm still so angry and bitter towards him. Yeah, I am so sorry for all the consternation that you're feeling on the inside. And it's definitely an issue that you can come to grips with, that you've struggled with. Um, You know, you're dealing with a brother in Christ, and you're not only dealing with a brother in Christ, you're dealing with a member of the church. And so Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 6, does any one of you, when he has a case against his neighbor, dare to go to law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you not know that the saints of this world, will, the saints will judge the world? If the world is judged by you, are you not competent to constitute the smallest law courts? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? So if you have law co- courts dealing with matters of this life, Do you appoint them as judges who are of no account in the church? I say this to your shame. It is so that there, it is, is it so that there is not among you one wise man who will be able to decide between his brethren, but brother goes to law with brother and that before unbelievers. Actually, then it is already a defeat for you that you have lawsuits with one another. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be defrauded? That would be preferable, he says, than to mock the Lord's testimony before some secular court. So you're dealing with a brother in Christ. You're dealing with a church member. And so the way this should be handled is with the leaders of your church. Uh, We call it elder court, so to speak, at CBC. We are um, structured in such a way that our polity is we are elder-led, we are deconserved, which I think, of course, is the New Testament model. I know some churches have a singular elder form of government, and the deacons end up functioning like elders, though they are two distinct offices, and the qualifications are not the same. They're much higher for an elder, so we shouldn't blur the two together. But however you're structured, you need to go to the leadership of the church. You need to present before them what took place. I hope when you say, like, for instance, you have a warranty that that's in writing and it's not just he said, she said kind of uh, talk, Uh, and you should put it in writing, even if it's a brother in Christ whom you love and you honor and you trust. Why? Because people are forgetful. Oh, is that what I promised you? Oh, I've forgotten that. And you put it in writing, it takes away any ambiguity You go to the elders of the church, and let's just say for the sake of argument, uh, again, the Bible says in Proverbs, a man's case seems just until another comes and examines it. And so there's two sides to every story, but assuming your side is accurate and reflective of what actually took place, 
And the elders say to this brother, hey, listen, you made a promise. You need to complete the work. You didn't. The, um, the family members stepped in, finished your work. Now there's warranty work that should be covered, and he refuses to do that. Then it becomes a church discipline issue at that point where if he refuses to listen, you treat him like an unbeliever. Now, preferably, ideally, if he is a true brother, you know, it's better to uh, be defrauded, Paul said, than to mock the name of Christ in some secular court. And so God does forbid a believer to sue another believer. Though if he is treated technically as an unbeliever, then you could technically sue him. And sometimes you're not dealing with a little work, you know, construction that he did in his house, but sometimes thousands, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars. And if you were not able to complete that arbitration process through the elders of the church or deacons or, again, however you're structured, and then uh, he, um, you know, is excommunicated, so to speak, from the church, you could technically sue him. But I don't think it would be preferable in your situation. It sounds like we're not dealing with tens of thousands of dollars. It was something that your father-in-law and husband, you said, were able to step in. He should be held accountable. And if he's not willing to be held accountable and to keep the promises that he's made, then he's a really bad testimony to your church. And if he doesn't listen to the church as a whole, then he should be dismissed from the fellowship of believers, and that has consequences, as 1 Corinthians 5, the prior chapter echoes, where you have a brother who's living in open sexual sin. He's sleeping with his stepmother. Everyone in the church knew it. They did nothing. Paul said, well, if you're not going to do anything, I might may not be there physically, but I'm going to do it in spirit, and he excommunicated him and gave him over to the devil because there is a protective umbrella that comes uh, in the church body. In addition, I would probably bring you, if you were in my office and sitting before me, um, I would bring you to 1 Peter chapter 2, where the Apostle Paul, uh, Peter, is dealing with people in the uh, church who have believers who are their masters, and sometimes unbelievers who are their masters, and that's a whole other sermon in itself. But he says, he makes this statement, servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and genuine, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor if for the sake of conscience towards God, a person bears up under sorrows when suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and you are harshly treated, you endure it with patience. But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, you patiently endure This finds, of course, favor with God. And then he says, you've been called for this purpose since Christ also suffered for you, uh, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Because if anyone ever suffered unjustly, it was the Lord Jesus because he never did anything wrong in his whole life. He committed no sin, nor was any deceit ever found in his mouth. And yet while being reviled, he didn't revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats but he entrusted himself to God who judges righteously. And of course, it resulted in our salvation as he bore our sins in his body on the cross. So there are times when the believer just has to suffer unjustly and follow Christ's example. And if you do that to the glory of God, God can certainly honor it. But again, I think this brother needs to be held accountable through the leadership of the church. And if he's not willing to either reimburse you, if that's what they decide, for the work that he didn't do, or at least at the minimum, they may forgive that debt and say, well, at the minimum, you need to uh, follow through in the warranty work. Then if that church is worth its leadership, then they're going to put him under church discipline, and it may mean ultimately dismissal. And if that happens, then I would suggest to you that you just leave it there. Uh, That's what I would do. I would suffer unjustly. Now, you mentioned, because I think the biggest issue here is forgiving him. And you mentioned the example of Jesus. The writer of the Hebrews, of course, quotes the prophet Jeremiah in the 10th chapter, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. What does that mean? You know, people say, well, you're supposed to forgive and forget. Is that really what the Scripture says? Um, Listen, if someone were to break into your house and murder a loved one, you'll never forget that person. So what does it mean, forgive and forget? It's not like God gets a case of divine amnesia when he remembers our sin no more. He's the omniscient God. 
But the way he remembers them is he does not hold that debt against us. And if you've really forgiven a person, the way you remember it becomes instrumental in whether or not you've truly released the person from the debt. And so it might be helpful to meditate on 1 Peter 2 and 3, but also on the parable that the Lord Jesus tells, of course, where a man... um, as a debtor, you know, the question that precedes the situation is how many times should I forgive my brother up to uh, seven times? And Jesus said, no, an infinite number of times, 70 times seven. And then he tells that parable in Matthew 18 of a guy who has a $20 million debt and his king graciously releases him from the debt. Does he forget it? No, because when he goes home and he has a $100 debt, and he demands the same repayment, he doesn't graciously forgive him as the king had forgave him. And, of course, that's a mark that a person is an unbeliever. So on the one hand, forgiving a person is a sign of conversion, Jesus teaches, but it is also something that a believer can struggle with. And so Paul commands us, be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving each other. How? Just like God in Christ Jesus forgave you. And so sometimes you just have to make a list of everything you can ever think of that God ever forgave you of, and then put it up against this one brother who ripped you off and say, look, if God forgave me of this $20 million debt, I've got to forgive my brother of this $100 debt. And again, it's the way you remember it. If you remember this brother with constant bitterness and hatred in your heart, then you really haven't released him of the debt. So God will give you the grace to do what he asks you to do, and he'll help you with it. But I think the starting point would be to go to your pastor and the leadership and hold a a Christian court, so to speak. Dr. Carl Brogy answers your questions about the Bible and living the Christian life Tuesday mornings at 11 on The Light, 88.7 FM, and online around the world at wagp.net.